Did you know that there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin and then it's all over? What? 21 million and then that's it. So not only is it a scarce asset, but it is completely redefining scarcity. And here to share more about that topic is a lovely panel. Come on up, guys. I'm going to introduce you all here at once. Jimmy Song, Peter McCormick, Alex Vladstein. Take it away. Hello. <laughs> right. Um, so one of the things that's really important for me not right now is how do we grow the pie? How do we bring more people into Bitcoin? Because it is quite a complicated thing. So just out of interest, before we start this panel, can you put your hand up if you don't own any Bitcoin? Well, like, it's like three of you. I mean, I'll give you some Bitcoin. <laughs> Come and see me afterwards. Okay, so we've got, some, we've got some people here who don't have any Bitcoin, so they might not understand about it. And it's great to have both Jimmy and Alex here because they've recently been working on a book the little Bitcoin book. So we're going to talk about this and why they uh, put the book together. So firstly, guys, you made a book in four days. How the hell do you write a book in four <laughs> days? I haven't written one in four years. <laughs> How do you do this? Yeah, so uh, I, I wrote another book, Programming Bitcoin for O'Reilly, and it's a fairly technical book, but it took me something like 14 months to complete. And, uh, and I was uh, with some other authors at O'Reilly, and they were telling me about one of them was telling me about this process called the book sprint, about writing a book in four days, similar to kind of like a coding sprint or a design sprint. Um, and that idea kind of stuck with me because I was so frustrated writing my book. And if you've ever written a book before, it is torture. Like you, you, you have to get yourself to sit down and write and it's like, you really don't want to write and you try to do like 500 words a day and you end up doing it in the, you know, right before you go to sleep and the words don't make any sense. And you know, there, there's a lot of drudgery and dread and loneliness about doing that whole thing. So when I heard about this, I was just like, oh, I, I gotta try this. If it works at all, that's the, that's the way to write a book. And, uh, and, I, uh, and Alex, uh, and I met at, uh, I think it was South by Southwest, and, uh, and we were having dinner, and he was telling me about a book, that, book project that he and another co-author of ours, Alex Lloyd, had. And he said, uh, you know, like, I, we would love to get your review because you're a technical guy that understands Bitcoin. And so I was like, oh, yeah, um, let me pitch you on this other idea of doing a book sprint. And that's, that's how it came together. Yeah, so basically, Alex and I called Jimmy and we wanted to get his feedback on our idea to write a book about how Bitcoin will change society from like a political and economic point of view. And Jimmy's like, no, 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 let, let me pitch you this idea. Let's all do this together. <laughs> so then we sort of put together this kind of really interesting diverse team of people from five continents. I mean, we had authors from Fil the Philippines um, with people who'd lived in China, people who were born under the Soviet Union, people from Venezuela, people from Nigeria. Uh, so that it was truly a global perspective. And we lived in a house for four or five days and we put the thing together. Pretty impressive stuff, guys. So the question I want to start with is why is this book required? Because right now, if somebody comes to you and says, oh, I want to learn about Bitcoin, we all say, oh, go to lop.net and click on resources and, <laughs> and read that collection. But it's whilst it's an amazing collection of resources, it isn't structured in an like, educational way. So why this book? Yeah, so for me, I'm not a technical person. I'm not someone who had a background in economics uh, or in finance. And I came to Bitcoin from my background as a human rights advo advocate and activist, which I'll get into later. Um, but it was very confusing to me. And a few years ago, when I started to try and learn more about Bitcoin, I, it, it was sort of uh, kind of like a land, you know, like, like, a, like a minefield of obstacles intellectually of videos trying to explain blockchain and cryptocurrency and all these different things. And for months and months, I really struggled. And I consider myself a pretty well-read, educated person. And it was really, really hard because even like Harvard Business Review um, and like, you know, the New York Times will publish articles that like conflate and, and kind of confuse all of these concepts. So it took me a really long time to actually figure out what Bitcoin was and why it mattered. And I really wanted to write a book that could like make a shortcut for people so they could quickly read it and then maybe decide, well, that was interesting, but it's not really for me. Or, wow, that was really interesting. I want to go deeper down the rabbit hole. And to be able to do it on like a short flight or, you know, read it in one day. That, that was the goal for me personally. 
one of the things I found when meeting various people in the Bitcoin world is actually a lot of people really struggle to articulate what is Bitcoin. When you explain to them, yeah, if somebody asks you what is Bitcoin, it's very difficult. And recently, I think it might have been Dan Held who said to me, you don't start with what is, you start with why. So Jimmy, why Bitcoin and should we explain what's wrong with money today? Yeah, uh, so we, we, when we were doing this whole sprint process and trying to figure out how to explain Bitcoin to people, we, we very quickly realized you can't really understand Bitcoin until you understand how money works. Right? And how, what, what the current system is like and why, it is, why things are the way they are. So, for ex instance, uh, many of you probably have an idea that the U.S. has an advantage over everybody else in some way, shape, or form. And that there's some, some unfairness that you've probably detected around the world about the U.S. having some sort of privileged position. Maybe it's related to the military or something like that, but you, you have some suspicion. Um, one of the things that we explain in the first chapter of the book is this whole concept of a dollar hegemony. And this was the result of World War II that we don't really learn about in history books. It's, uh, it's that the U.S. has a monetary sovereignty essentially over the entire world through the dollar standard. And this came as a result of something called the Bretton Woods Agreement after World War II. So, Talking about that and all of the ways in which that has broken the world. Right now, it, it, it costs a lot of money, for example, to send money from Kenya and Nigeria. They're, they're border countries, right? They're like 30 miles from each other. But, you know, it, it costs a significant amount of money to convert uh, money from one currency to the other. The reason is because of the dollar hegemony. There's, there's liquidity for the Kenyan shilling against the U.S. dollar, uh, but uh, not against the Kenyan shilling and the Nigerian naira. So that sort of thing, like learning about that, and not just that, but there's obviously the whole, um, whole thing about the monetary debasement that we've been going, on, uh, going through for the last you know, 100 years on their fiat money. And that, that's something that not a lot of people realize, even in the US, that you, you, people tend to think inflation's like one or 2%. No, if you take the actual traditional definition of inflation, it's more like 6.7%. The M2 money supply in the United States has gone up 50x since 1959. 60 years, 50x, that ends up being about 6.7%. And that's like a really good return in a stock market or real estate. You're just running to stand still. And that's something that not a lot of people recognize. And, uh, and going uh, and talking about that, and all of this is mostly about the US, right? It's much worse in the third world, right? The inflation rates and the monetary debasement that you experience and the, uh, and the fees that you have to pay, the fact that some New York banker makes money some, when somebody is transferring money from Kenya to Nigeria should make you outraged a little bit. And that, that, that's what we wanted to put into that first chapter. Hopefully we succeeded, you guys let us know. Yeah, and in my work as a human rights activist, I constantly meet people who live under very repressive governments. And it made me realize how lucky I am to, to have access to the dollar and have access to the US financial system. But billions of people don't have that. Billions of people live under dictatorships and authoritarian regimes where the governments use currency to control the people and they impose capital controls like today. And Argentina imposed capital controls today so people can, you know, it's much harder for them to, to buy dollars with their peso, right? This has happened historically everywhere and it's a way for people uh, in government power to sort of restrict the like abilities and liberties of the people who live under them and, and basically figure out how to stay in power for longer, right? And money is such an important piece of human rights um, and it's something I observed, uh, you know, in studying activist movements around the world. And what you start to see is that maybe this like global neutral payment network, that, which, is, which is what Bitcoin is, is something that's gonna start changing this a little bit. So you know, we really wanted to get in and explain kind of what was wrong with money today, how it's uh, like really hard for most people to use, how it's very difficult to send abroad for most people. Even as an, an American, it's really hard for you to, in America to send even money to Mexico. Um, my my uh, wife's older sister's husband is Mexican and I'm asking him yesterday, you know, how do you send money to your family? And he's like, I use Western Union and it takes many days and it's like, it, sometimes it doesn't work. And it's so ridiculous because I'm sitting there with him and we could send Bitcoin uh, to his family within half an hour, you know, and they could then go to a Mexican exchange and exchange that into pesos within several hours, right? So Bitcoin is already disrupting the global model for how money works 
And it's, it's kind of, a, again, like as Jimmy's saying, it's kind of an exciting time to be alive. I had it similar when I was trying to pay somebody in Japan for work. It's a Western country to a Western country. We couldn't do it with the banks. We, could not, we couldn't make it work bank to bank from Western country to Western country. But do you think sometimes it's a little bit harder for people maybe in Western countries like the US or the UK to understand this because the debasement's a little bit more subtle than say somewhere like Argentina and Venezuela. Do you find when you are talking to people in those countries, it resonates with them quicker? Yeah, when I talk to someone from Zimbabwe or from Venezuela or Iran, they're like, wait, money that government doesn't control? Tell me more, I'm very interested, okay? When I talk to someone, you know, generally speaking, who's like an educated American or in, in European, they're like, very skeptical, you know, why would we need that? Our system works so well. Well, you know what, you're lucky. You're one of the you know, few people in the world, a small percentage of people whose economic system works actually pretty well for a variety of reasons, and a lot of them have to do with what Jimmy talked about. But the reality is the majority of people in the world don't have the luxury of having the dollar or the euro. They have a currency that gets debased year after year, 10%, 20%, 100% in the case of a country like Turkey or Iran, or 10 million percent in the case of a country like Venezuela. And they need a different system. This is something that they need. So Jimmy, we get people converted, we convince them, they're interested in Bitcoin, they think, right, I wanna buy this, and they do their research, and then they realize it's quite volatile, the price can go crazy up and down. So how do we, how do we deal with this? How do we explain people to, uh, this to people and get them to accept this as part of Bitcoin for now? Yeah, so I, we spent the whole chapter on that, actually. Like, there, there's where does the value of Bitcoin come from and, you know, how come it has value and so on. I, we, there's a whole chapter before that about uh, the actual scarcity of Bitcoin and what makes it special, how it's actually decentralized as opposed to pretty much everything else out there. Um, you, got, you guys can obviously read uh, some of the book to, to learn about that. But the volatility is actually something that comes along with the decentralization. The fact that there's nobody in control means that there's no central bank in control, right? Like uh, for almost any currency, what the central bank does in order to keep prices in a narrow range, what they call a peg, is they, when it, whenever it gets too low, they, uh, they buy up some of their own currency off the market. And whenever it gets too high, they sell some of their, to, uh, their currency. And they, they sort of, quote unquote, manage the economy. But the fact that they can do that also gives them the power to print more money. And eventually, when they print too much, their currency collapses like it's doing in Venezuela and so on. The fact that Bitcoin doesn't have some sort of center means that there's no micro adjustments that it can make, so there's a lot more volatility that ends up happening, and that's, that's indeed what's, what's happened. Plus, you can trade Bitcoin pretty much 24-7. Even foreign exchange markets don't trade that, uh, like, on a 24-7 basis like we do. Yeah, we tr in that chapter, and we wanted to make it as simple as possible, we basically broke down the reasons why Bitcoin has a price and why it's volatile into short-term, medium-term, and long-term reasons. Short-term, there's market manipulation, there's other cryptocurrencies which are collapsing and being launched. There's a lot of reasons for like the day-to-day -day fluctuations. Medium term, there's like ecosystem-wide changes. Like every so often, every, every couple years, the reward that people who mine Bitcoin get as, as a reward for doing, you know, spending a lot of electricity to secure the network changes. It goes down by 50%, it gets halved. So that, you know, is a massive point of volatility. There's also like price of the equipment of buying the mining machines. So this goes up and down seasonally. Price of electricity changes. So these are like medium term things which will cause volatility. Long term though, it's kind of like what Jimmy's talking about. You've got a scarce asset. There's only, only ever gonna be 21 million Bitcoins. There's already what, 17, 18 million that have already been mined, right? And basically there's no way to print more. So you're gonna have, right now you have no more than 1% of humans on our planet who, who have any or even know about it really in a significant way. And you're gonna have a huge number of people in the coming years learning about it and coming in and it's gonna be a scarce supply and there's no way to print more. So it's going to be very volatile for, for probably quite some time. Okay, I think I've got time for one more question. Okay, so what's great here, we, I put a question out at the start, who doesn't have any Bitcoin? There's about three people. And do come and see me afterwards, I will get, get you off zero. Um, but. We have, have a any. we have a group of people in here. I, I'm not going to give them a whole Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> we have a group of people in here, obviously uh, Bitcoiners. Um, 
we can all go back to Twitter and start fighting we, like every day like we do, or we can go out and we can help spread the knowledge and try and help grow the pie. And if that's the job, based on putting the book together, what do you think are the kind of key messages that we could take out there to kind of simply uh, explain Bitcoin to people to get them interested beyond saying buy the book? Well, uh, for me, the, this book was kind of a revelation because it's not a book that any one of us could have written. I actually learned quite a bit from my co-authors just how Bitcoin is perceived around the world. Uh, so what, one of the big conclusions that we came to from, I think, uh, sort of writing the book, at least I did, is that there, there is sort of this perception that's, uh, you know, dominant in Silicon Valley and so on, which is that Bitcoin is some sort of technology and we, that, that's the main thing that we need to focus on. It's not it at all. If you look at the actual use cases, how people are using it, what, 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 what's changing people's behavior and so on, the big innovation of Bitcoin is that it is sound money. It is decentralized money. It is money that cannot be controlled by anybody. And that is a profound, profound invention. And if you think through all of the implications of that, which we try to do in chapter five with uh, you know, all the different ways in it, which it will impact society, it, it goes way beyond mere technology. It, it, it is life-changing to everybody around the world. And I mean, we, we were talking earlier about like getting this translated into Korean and Alex is like, let's get it into North Korea. I'm like, they don't really even have internet. How, what, what's gonna make, what, you know, how, how are they gonna? It's like, well, you know, met a, a lot of Bitcoiners, uh, I've met a lot of North Korean uh, refugees and, uh, and you know, they understand the concept right away. See, when, when you've been oppressed a lot, you understand this stuff, and you understand what the impact can be. And, uh, and you know, th th that's the main thing, at, at least for me. Uh, yeah, for me, I think it's more uh, general for anyone here. If you can become kind of like an expert, uh, or at least knowledgeable about Bitcoin, either in your family or your company, um, or your, your neighborhood or your organization, that's going to be really valuable for you over the coming years. You're going to be like the first person that anyone else turns to to ask questions about. And you're going to be, you know, in a, in a really good position. And that's why I kind of tell people like, you know, I, I know we're trying to like get off zero here, but, you know, invest your time in, in Bitcoin, not necessarily your, your money. Become educated, learn more. I, and I almost can guarantee you that once you start to learn the basics, you're going to get really interested really fast. We're going to learn more from other amazing speakers like Jill about the fact that like we don't even know who created Bitcoin. I mean, there's so many mysteries. It's really the greatest mystery of the 21st century. And there's just more and more around every corner. And it's this endless rabbit hole that you go down. And it becomes endlessly fascinating. And it's something that can be a huge personal benefit to you no matter what you, no matter where you are, what industry you're in, especially if you're, if you're in finance, though. So I would say, you know, invest your time in Bitcoin and get educated and, you know, ride the wave with us. Fantastic. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Alex.